Welcome to the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we revisit the episode with Mario Peshev, business advisor, angel investor and CEO of Rush. And we discuss how to survive a recession and build a more resilient business over time. So let's dive right into it. This is the e-commerce coffee break. A top rated Shopify growth podcast dedicated to Shopify merchants and business owners looking to grow their online stores. Learn how to survive in the fast-changing e-commerce world with your host, Klaus Lauter, and get marketing advice you can't find on Google. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of the e-commerce Coffee Break podcast. Today, we want to talk into a topic that every mountain version should have on the list. It's the economy overall. So we want to talk about the topic on how to survive a recession and thrive and make the best out of it. With me on the show today to talk about this is Mario Beschev. He is a business advisor, fractional CXO, CEO of Rush, Defrix, Gross Shuttle and other products. He is also an angel investor of Seedblink in Bulgaria and ambassador of Flipper in Bulgaria. He has been in web development and business space for over 17 years and on a day-to-day -day basis, he's wearing different hats from working with tech teams to creating business solutions for Shopify and WooCommerce vendors. So he has a very vast background in running a business and that's one we're going to talk about. Hi Mario, how are you today? Doing great, Klaus, and thanks for the intro. I think I should probably hire you for my next PR person, so if you're open for that, <laughs> <gig. laughs> Mario, we are all business owners and we are all sort of victims of what is happening in the world right now. And it seems that we are a bit in for a rocky road ahead. Um, from your perspective, what do you think is happening right now um, with the economy, with recession, with inflation? Just give me a bit of an idea. As you mentioned, I'm involved with a number of different businesses, right? On the one hand, it's Rush, which is a Shopify app, and we have over 2,700 stores. On the other end, there's uh, Devrix, and we main some of the largest publishers on the planet, including affiliate and e-commerce. Uh, also, as a business advisor, I work with hundreds of businesses. So I have a pretty diverse perspective and uh, kind of an outlook of the general macroeconomy, and it's something that I'd like to kind of do for, for fun, even though it's not the funniest thing for most people out there. But on the bright side, looking into the, the latest micro results, uh, looking into how the Fed has slowed down the interest rate increases lately, even though they still did a 0.25% just a week ago, we are actually in a pretty good state right now. And I just want to reassure everyone else listening to the podcast that despite everything that has happened over the past year, despite the several waves of layoffs among the largest companies out there, the major drop of S&P 500, we are in a really good state right now. For example, just taking a look at the Q2 data that was just released in late in July and early in August, Meta just reported an 11% revenue growth. And as we know, Meta is primarily making money off of ads and ads are coming from brands trying to advertise their businesses, which in result means that maintaining the same cost per click for the most part on Meta's end businesses, brands, stores, publishers, you know, DTCs, manufacturers, everyone else, GPLs are still investing and investing 11% heavier as compared to last year in Q2 this year. That's one thing. Alphabet, uh, which is Google, and this includes Google and YouTube, they exceeded expectations both on top and bottom lines. And the Google Cloud revenue is also by 28% which again, in turn means that more businesses are signing up and hosting on Google Cloud and also everyone using any form of Google Cloud resource, including BigQuery, which is a main machine for delivering data and storing and aggregating data. That's also growing in Q2. Shopify, of course, everyone's interested in that, reported 31% growth in total revenue and cash flow. And it's also cash flow positive for a third quarter in a row. Right. Amazon, once again, they just had Prime Day, mid of July, and the Prime Day numbers were record high this year. I think they generated about 375 million orders over the course of 48 hours, up from 300 million last year. Right. So it's over 20%, 24% or so increase compared to what they did last year. So, all things considered, when you look at the general macro, businesses are still spending on ads. Consumer intents and behaviors are still up in the air. And the last thing I, again, I, I just want to remind is that normally Q4 is the strongest period of the year for everyone in e-commerce, meaning that considering we are just about to enter Q4, we should be pretty safe up until the, the end of the year. 
And unless there are any surprises, Q1 should be, again, slower than Q4, of course, but hopefully not as bad. But at the very least, the rest of this year should be smooth sailing onward. I'm in Argentina right now, and they have sort of hyperinflation here. It's kind of interesting because the economy here is actually booming. So the money gets devalued in a very, very fast rate. And everyone is shopping. Restaurants are full. Um, everyone is carrying around shopping bags because people think, is I rather buy today because tomorrow it will be more expensive. So I'm not sure if that's going to happen next year, but you might see something like there. Now, there's obviously certain industries that do better than others right now. And um, that applies for e-commerce as well. From your perspective, working with so many businesses, do you see specific verticals or industries that have a good time and some that have a, a struggle right now? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the jewelry market, bracelets, beauty, cosmetics, all of that is still booming, which is... I would say it's slightly interesting because normally it's kind of more on the luxurious or it's kind of higher on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid. But at the end of the day, this is still a market that's still booming and all of our stores, especially on the rush end, are generating incredible results right now. Apparel is going down. All forms of clothing are generally going down from what we see, primarily due to the fact that after three years of a recession, people are trying to go out more and just spend kind of more time trying out clothes and, and those not really deal with any of the specific risks of returns and, you know, wrong sizing, wrong clothing in itself are some of the specific problems that most people are dealing with, which is why the kind of clothing industry is slightly worse than it used to be. Groceries are up from what we see. Again, consolidated data of over 400 million in GMV that we generate, that we you know, managed last year and more or less the same what we do this year is uh, groceries are still up and that's primarily due to the inflation, right? So the GMV is definitely up due to the inflation. The volume is slightly down because of the end of the pandemic, but it's more or less still the same and slightly growing. So these are some of the patterns that we see. There's some seasonality as well. Uh, for instance, in April and May, we saw a lot of growth in the outdoor industry, right? Uh, anything for your garden, for your patio, for anything else that's kind of outdoors. Uh, this was a pretty strong, pretty significant category out there. And another thing, again, that we see right now is indoors kind of home accessories, kitchen, any additional stuff for indoors because again summer is going to be over soon and people are preparing just to renovate or add additional accessories to their homes you mentioned before that people are still buying and q4 obviously is the strongest quarter of the year and um, merchants should be by now ready with their strategy what's happening in these three months to make the most out of it but you can also sort of make your business more resilient for a recession so there's some strategies around that. Tell me about how you would do that. I would say that one of the key things and my rules of thumb is diversification, right? Whatever you do, regardless of whether you're in DTC and kind of building a strong brand or in drop shipping, make sure that you diversify as best as possible. I'm going to give a specific example here. One of the challenges that I deal with as an advisor speaking to different store owners is they have one source of traffic and one specific website, probably one or two specific products or SKUs that are killing it, right? They're generating over 80, sometimes over 90% of their revenue. That's great up until it isn't. Just earlier today, I heard from a friend, they woke up and got their Facebook account banned due to a random post they posted, or they may or may not have posted. Now, it could have been a bot or their account got hacked or it's something they posted as a comment and got flagged, whatever it is. So their account got banned. And we know that Meta is the key channel for generating revenue and sales for most stores. So imagine you wake up one day, Meta has banned your account. It may work eventually, but you're probably going to be disconnected for like at least a week. That's a pretty frightening thought in itself. So most people are dealing with, once again, one source of traffic, one specific store or kind of a brand, and one or two specific products that they're dealing with. So first and foremost, diversification is key. Make sure you expand the number of SKUs or expand the number of products if you can. And especially if you're in dropshipping, just launch different stores, right? We work with dropshippers that own 10, 15, even 20 different stores, especially on the rush side, because 
you know, Rush is supporting so many different things for dropshippers in particular on the Shopify end. But lots of, again, entrepreneurs launching 20 different stores, right? One is for electronics. One is for, you know, some beauty stuff. One is for outdoors. One is for jewelry. One is for beard oil, right? Different SKUs for different kind of products just to diversify. So that's kind of one thing. In terms of channels, if you're on Meta, look into TikTok, look into influencer marketing, look into ICO, look into brand attribution. And kind of the last thing is, again, I always advise, regardless of whether you're brand first or more about the traditional dropshipping, which is we launch something, we scale, and then we can launch 50 other different stores. Building a brand is always helpful because you retain your audience in the long run, right? They're going to stick around. They're going to convert better. They're going to support you. There's in some cases, especially in terms of uh, in kind of in times of recession, we've seen people prioritizing their favorite brand just so that they can support that, even if it means cutting on alcohol or going out or anything like that, right? Just the sheer support being a true fan of a specific brand or specific product is so helpful that they can literally save you in times of a recession. So definitely think about it. Hey Klaus here, just a quick one. If you like the content of this episode, subscribe to the weekly newsletter at newsletter.ecommercecoffeebreak.com. I score and curate 50 news sources so you don't have to, saving you hours of research. Grow your revenue with e-commerce news, marketing strategies, tools, podcast interviews and more, all in a quick three-minute read. So head over to newsletter.ecommercecoffeebreak.com to subscribe, as said, 100% free. Also, you will find the link in the show notes. And now back to the show. Yeah, we're definitely on the same page there. So uh, diversification, I also pray that to everyone, probably the most important thing you can do. Uh, it comes with the drawback that a lot of smaller and uh, solopreneurs, small and medium enterprise, they only have the skill set built up for one specific ad platform for Facebook ads or for Google ads, and then they struggle. So, but it's definitely worse to find ways to test all the other platforms and see where your audience is. Now, I like that you say build up your followership, your your super fans, because they will carry you through the bad times. Looking into a little bit of strategies on how you can facilitate apps or solutions on your website, on your store, like pay later features, what do you think would work to draw people in for a long term into your business? Several things here. So first off, in terms of brand building, I think that lots of store owners are under valuing and underappreciating the the importance of building their own personal brand. And that's something that's really unique to the e-commerce space, right? As someone who also runs other businesses and is an angel investor, speaks to investors and journalists and you know other CEOs and majors and so on, my go-to, I spend a good chunk of my time on LinkedIn, right? So I go on LinkedIn, look at brands, look at people, and essentially, that's kind of how we connect and grow. Alternatively, I spend time on Twitter because lots of the VCs and angel investors and also store owners and startup founders, including Shopify app founders and journalists, which is essentially media and PR, are also on Twitter, right? So these are the two networks that I use. And again, I understand there are lots of Facebook communities, there are Discord communities, there's Instagram. So I'm also there, even though not as active, but I'm always surprised how hard it is sometimes to find a store owner or even a store page just listed out there. Several examples. Yesterday, I wanted to connect with a store owner that signed up for our Shopify app just because they're, they were local. I knew they were in Bulgaria, so I just wanted to kind of reach out to them. And I couldn't, right? Uh, I knew the founder's name. I couldn't find them online. I found their Facebook page. It had zero posts whatsoever, right? They were generating, say, uh, half a million in GMV, but they were nowhere to be found, right? No LinkedIn, no Twitter, no nothing, right? Uh, another example is we had a partner agency that signed up with us probably three months ago. They signed up one store, another store. We generated so much revenue for their clients that they signed up another 10 stores over the course of probably six weeks. So I just wanted to send them a gift. It took us probably a week to get their office details in order to ship. And even knowing their office details, I just sent them a basket yesterday, by the way, with champagne and cheese and biscuits and all that fancy stuff, just as a gratitude gift, right? Just supporting us and kind of loving what to do. But but it was so hard just finding these people online. Now I have their names and phone numbers and others and companies, and I can still find nothing about them. So bottom line, I digress a bit, but it's so important. It makes so much difference building a brand to be recognizable, to be known for something that it carries so much value that there's hardly any reason to, to avoid that. So this is probably going to be kind of one of the, the key things I would like to mention. You also brought up buy now, pay later. 
that's definitely a thing in 2023, right? It's uh, growing, it's booming. There are specific industries, specific categories. On the one hand, we have teenagers, well, late teenagers, you know, college students and so on in their early 20s. They cannot afford some stuff, but they like, right? So they're trying to spread around and do the credit card alternative nowadays, which is buy now, pay later. Nothing wrong about that if they're, you know, cautious consumers in the future. There's also people trying to buy new equipment or trying to make use of specific deals like cheap or laptops or cheaper tablets or so that they can possibly use for work, right? And can, you know, they simply cannot afford that yet. So uh, right now, there are around 360 million buy now, pay later users, right? The market itself is worth over $150 billion. So we definitely shouldn't neglect that. So uh, all things considered, lots of things that people can do, especially store owners and about drop shippers and brands and print on demand and everyone else in between. And kind of one of the easiest things, again, speaking as a, a Shopify app owner, is uh, setting up rush. We've seen that first and foremost, it generates an average 2 to 7% increase in GMV and average order value for our store owners. You set it up, tracking page comes with recommended widgets, with bundles and products and top sales and so forth. That alone, just setting it up, gets 2 to 7% increase in average order value. That's one thing. Our higher tier customers get access to Clavio workflows. These flows have been tried and tested, and we know that on average, we get a 5x return on investment over the first 30 days. In fact, some of these agencies that I've been mentioning, setting up users, they send the screenshots 48 hours, 72 hours later saying, oh my God, guys, what we see is $2,000 or more generating extra revenue just from the flows alone, right? So we have Clavio, we have the upsells on the page, and that's an easy win. We have several you know, of our brands like Primal Harvest, like Burger, like some of the other players that we work with. Some of them have reported over 2,000% ROI. Now, imagine spending $100 and getting 20x, right? Just getting $2,000 back. Investing $1,000, getting 20 grand back. If we were able to do that in real life outside of e-commerce, everyone would be a millionaire overnight just because it's now possible. So what I'm saying is, again, Rush is one of the solutions that it's kind of set and forget, and our team can definitely help you out with that. That's one of the solutions, but look into other alternatives and other options to just provide better user experience to your customers, right? Abandoned cards, again, reasons Clavio, Omniscient, and everyone is important. Abandoned cards are increasing additional revenue for you. Right, surveys, uh, all that kind of uh, wheel of fortune type of thing, so that you can capture emails or capturing SMS, the ability to send, you know, follow up emails and campaigns, uh, make use of all the, you know, back to school campaigns. Uh, now we are, you know, now we have uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday and Christmas. There's so many different holidays in between that uh, people need to to tap into. One of the things, for instance, in and I mentioned Prime Day a bit earlier on the Amazon end. Again, Amazon generated shipped over 375 million orders <laughs> over the course of two days. And speaking to Shopify owners, I'm saying, are you ready for Prime Day? And they're, no, this is an Amazon holiday. And I'm like, what are you talking about? People are out there ready for a major holiday. Amazon has invested, you know, maybe over 50 million or so in advertising to make sure they are ready for this day. And you're not tapping into that opportunity. At the same time, I'm giving a call to an APA aggregator, right? A business running over a hundred different brands. And I'm asking them, are you ready for Prime Day? And they're, we sure are. Half of our stores already have banners and deals up and discounts and all of that because it's the same holiday for the shopping period, right? Um, so yeah, again, I can rumble about that for, probably for hours, but so many additional opportunities just Zoom out a little bit, take a look at the broader e-commerce ecosystem. It's so diverse, right? See what happens in WooCommerce, see what happens in Amazon, in Etsy, in Walmart, in Target. They run different campaigns. They compete with each other. And just learn from them, right? Try to get the best practice for different systems and uh, services and apps and brands and everyone. And this is really going to help you elevate and optimize everything for your digital business. Well, there's so much good tips in there. Being present with your contact details in the market is so important on many, many levels. First of all, it, on your website, and I see that a lot, specifically on dropshipping stores, they're sort of trying to hide you. There's no contact details whatsoever. 
that does not really build trust, that does not really help you with building up enough trust to build a brand. So you should have your contact details on your website with who's behind the company, who runs the show, maybe even who's the founder and so on and so forth. And on the other end, as you said, be as a founder, as an entrepreneur, be public on LinkedIn, on Twitter, because that helps you sometimes even if things do not go well, if you need a co-financer, if you need to have a, another partner, whatsoever. If you have built a network there, it will definitely help you to reach out and find the right person to help you with whatever challenge you have in your business. I have plenty of examples on how that works in a positive favor for you. Now, before we come to the end of the coffee break today, is there anything you want to share with the listeners that we haven't covered yet? I really love your comments on branding. And again, I just want to reiterate. So if you take a look at, uh, again, what my Twitter feed looks like, right? This morning, looking into the founder of Rich, looking for a content strategist and willing to pay a million dollars for them, right? We have, you know, founders of Gymshark or Woody or, or, or any of the top famous popular brands. There's Nick Sharma who's so active out there, right? This is Twitter and LinkedIn and all the other networks. So there's a reason why the guys that we admire and we learn from are so loud out there. They're publicly available. They speak so much, they preach so much, right? And not trying to learn from them is counterintuitive. So that's probably the only thing. It's it's nothing new. It's more about food for thought. Why, why does everyone successful spend so much time online? Because this is the way to connect, especially after three years of pandemic. So many people who weren't as active online are now online and they're already used to just being approachable, available. There are also specific services such as what was it? It was Mastermind, Masterclass, just forgot the name of it, but you can actually reach out to these D2C influencers and speak with them and connect with them. Masterpass, yes, this, uh, this was it. So go on Masterpass, you can speak to some of the brightest minds on the planet. So right now, these people are spending more time online. They're at the tip of your fingers and just building brand awareness means that you're going to be more visible, more recognizable, more trustworthy and expand your network as a result. Mm-hmm. Now, with your vast experience, you're helping your clients. Tell me a little bit about who is your client and how do you help? Well, that probably depends on the different businesses that they're doing with. But to sum it up, my main focus is working with different businesses from the broader Shopify, Amazon e-commerce ecosystem, right? We work with software as a service, we work with data companies, we work with 3PLs, we work with manufacturers, we work with factories, and we're just trying to build that bundle. My personal philosophy is that the e-commerce is a broader industry. And as I said earlier, most people are just kind of trying to niche into one very specific thing. Well, that's not how it works. We partner up with other people, right? On the real shop, we have partnership managers. We have people who build relationships with other app founders, with uh, agencies, with team developers, with PPC people, with conversion rate optimizers, with everyone else. Because we want to make sure that whenever we connect to someone, right, a Shopify store, a 3PL, someone who wants a kind of a deeper, broader integration, we want to make sure that whatever problems they face, we can include them as a bundle for them. Like say, hey, you know, we can set up Rush for you, for example, right? But on top of that, hey, did you know that you can set up, uh, you know, be profit for dashboards? And by the way, you know, in top of Clearview, you can also do retention.com for, you know, acquiring additional revenue from that. And we have a conversion rate optimizing expert. Here's an agency for that. Here's for that. So we want to be the... The, the, our mission is just supporting businesses and supporting brands by all means with whatever they need. Because uh, again, we've been in business long enough and I myself again have been uh, in business for almost 20 years now. Uh, so I have had that fight already. I've walked the walk and I've, I know what businesses are struggling with, right? On my own blog, I have the 38 biggest business challenges that companies face at different points in time. This is something that got picked up by over 30 universities out there, right? I get uh, reached out by Northeastern and by so, so many universities just using that as a resource. So again, helping uh, other people out, just being more present, being more public is not a bad thing. Like even if you're, even if you feel that drop shipping is just buying something, you know, from Asia and selling to the States, that's not necessarily it, right? You're providing opportunities. You're giving the ability for people to reach and learn about these products because otherwise they wouldn't, to get an opportunity to get clear, transparent shipping, connect with you, get the best offers, the best deals, because people are lazy. Don't forget that. People are lazy. Again, many price conscious shoppers, but people are generally lazy. So understanding that 
means that you being the go-to place to provide these opportunities, provide these products is not a bad thing. And you can actually even get to the point where you charge high ticket drop shipping items instead of just trying to be beat uh, to the race to the bottom. So again, some food for thought here. No, that's very, very true. Mario, where can people find out more about you? My personal website is mariopeshev.com. People can look up Mario Peshev on LinkedIn, on Twitter, which I spend most of my time. For Shopify stuff, rush.app is our own app. And feel free to reach out personally if you have any follow-up questions. But it was definitely a pleasure, Klaus. And thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to, to talk about the broader ecosystem once again. Absolutely. I will put the links in the show notes, then you're just one click away. And thanks for giving us an overview. I think um, the future is bright for e-commerce. No one should be scared for what's coming. And if you really, to our listeners, if you really want to talk to someone who knows what's happening out there and needs some help, then please reach out to Mario. Thanks so much for your time today and talk soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Hey Klaus here, thanks for joining me on another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Before you go, I'd like to ask two things from you. First, please help me with the algorithm so I can bring more impactful guests on the show. It will make it also easier for others to discover the podcast. Simply like, comment and subscribe in the app you're using to listen to the podcast and even better if you could leave a rating. Thanks again and I'll catch you in the next episode. Have a good one.